virtually every time that the Supreme Court under, um, th that was form formed by uh, President Reagan to a large extent, virtually every time that court ruled, it ruled in favor of uh, big government and in favor of big business. But it was a Fort Worth situation in which the jury found that the police had used excessive force. But the Court of Appeals, again, the Federal Court of Appeals, said, well, the police acted in good faith because they had testified that was the way they were trained. And since they were trained oh, that way, God. that was okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can beat somebody up if you do it in good faith. That's exactly that right. Because the court has said, the Supreme Court has said, you have, uh, once you've had a trial, and that trial is procedurally correct, then um, that's all you get. The 14th Amendment does not protect you against being wrongly executed. <laughs> but only executed without the proper procedures. Houston, uh, which is probably the most bloodthirsty county right now in Texas in terms of capital punishment. Uh, in fact, more people are in death row from, Tex from Harris County than from mo most of the countries in the world that still do have capital punishment, and from most of the states. There are more people on death row from Harris County than from most of the states in the Union right now. That's how many people are coming out of Harris County. But because of that, their courts in Harris County are going to be tied up until the year 2020, right now, doing nothing but capital punishment trials. Civil libertarians were justifiably fearful of a Republican administration. We're going to take a close look at what happened as a result of the Reagan administration at the local, national, and state levels right now on Alternative Views. We're going to be talking about a very basic subject on alternative views, and that is civil rights. A civil rights lawyer in Washington, D.C. told me one time, if you don't have civil rights, you don't have anything. Everything starts from that. We're going to be talking with Jim Harrington, who is head of the Texas Civil Rights Project, who also has an office down in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas in San Juan. But before we have our interview with Jim Harrington, Let's have some news stories from the Alternative Press. As we pointed out many times in Alternative Views, the uh, presentations about NAFTA and the establishment media were just terrible. Lies, distortions, leaving information out. Uh, but here's another thing which they haven't talked about, and that is that American taxpayers are now legally bound to bail out Mexico's roller coaster economy. Remember over the years how the peso has gone up and down, particularly down, and uh, the value would just be uh, uh, really lowered considerably. Well, now the U.S. government is obligated to prop up the Mexican economy with handouts of billions, tens of billions of dollars. This was something which uh, Lloyd Benson, the Treasury Secretary, mentioned on April uh, 26th. He said that he called it a trilateral foreign exchange swap facility. It was designed to shore up the finances of NAFTA. So the U.S. Treasury will hand over $8.8 .8 billion into a permanent credit pool for Mexico. And Mexico can dip into this whenever it needs dollars to refloat its own foundering currency. 
Now, Clinton had actually given Mexico $9.2 billion a month earlier. This $9.2 billion was uh, given to Mexico in order to shore up the Mexican economy when it got the jitters after the pre, the leading uh, political parties, candidate had been assassinated. So Mexico is really doing well as a result of NAFTA, but you and I, the taxpayers, we are the ones paying for it. Not getting the profits. We have the privilege of paying for it. Carrizo, which is a maquiladora in the Piedras Negras area, is one of the three apparel manufacturing factories that is owned by the Salent Corporation Company of, of New York. Now, in this particular plant, there are no extractors, so fibers from the fur that is worked on there fill the, the air of the plant. A young man who worked there for five years and was in perfect health condition when he began working there became infected in one of his lungs during his third year of working in the factory. He did receive sick leave for work-related illness for the first leave that he did request. However, during the past two years, he was on leave repeatedly due to the same illness and was not granted work-related sick leave. This means that he only received half of his pay. Now, his doctors repeatedly recommended that he be placed in an area of the factory where he would not be exposed to this fur. But since the entire factory was a fur factory, this was impossible. On October 8th, he was scheduled for an operation in Monterey for his lungs, but by this time, both of his lungs were severely infected from the factory environment. The man died in Monterey, and the cause of his death is still unknown. Nicaragua seems almost on the verge of collapse. The United States has done nothing to help the country, as it promised, after the election of Chamorro, and the Sandinistas were pushed out of office, even though they still with 40 percent of the uh, votes were the largest uh, group, the most effective group, and the one that was needed to help run the country. But the Sandinistas still maintain control of the army, and the U.S. said, no, that's got to go. But Chamorro knew that there was no other force that could be used to do this. Well. However, even though Chamorro did not get rid of the Sandinista-controlled army, she did impose austerity measures that was demanded by the United States and the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These austerity measures hit hard, of course, at the public sector and at the agricultural sector. And as a result, Managua was paralyzed by a general strike. The revolution had awakened popular and class uh, uh, consciousness that uh, during the revolution, and so it didn't take too much to get them uh, upset. But now the Sandinista party leadership had not called for a general strike. And however, for the austerity program, some of the Sandinistas are now supporting this. So the Sandinistas are kind of being torn apart by internal strife, some supporting austerity, some are not. And even within the army, when this general strike occurred, the uh, army generally stood aside and didn't do anything to break up the demonstrations or to repress uh, the, them as they were paralyzing uh, traffic. But as time has gone on, the uh, head of the government has started to clamp down more, and particularly Humberto Ortega, who is head of the government and uh, uh, the uh, brother of Daniel Ortega, who is head of the Sandinistas, uh, he started to clamp down not only on Sandinistas, but also on right-wingers. They've even set up a uh, internal security system, which kind of functioning kind of like death squads, and they're clamping down on the far right. So the whole situation in the country is in turmoil. Economic is a, uh, econ economy of the country is in a mess. It's a dangerous place to be in now, whereas it used to be the safest in the in the hemisphere. The economy is, is in terrible shape, whereas under the Sandinistas, before the U.S. Uh, set the counters down there to destroy the revolution, the economy was growing at a rate faster than any other country in the whole Western Hemisphere. And But things are, are really very, very difficult for the whole population. In this article uh, put out by the NACLA, they indicate that we have to remember that Nicaragua is only part of Central America, and these same forces 
uh, creating social instability and upheaval are also in effect in El Salvador and in Guatemala and even in, in uh, stable Costa Rica austerity measures are have created such a bad situation there economically that uh, there is starting to be popular resistance and clamped down by the uh, government forces so they may suppress a lot of these a lot of the discontent in this part of the uh, western hemisphere but it is still there and it'll pop up some way uh, soon or if not soon sometime in the future and the united states is going to have to deal positively with it instead of with the usual repression we'll have time for some more news later in the program but now let's have our interview with jim harrington who's director of the texas civil rights project we're going to talk about civil liberties and the reagan legacy Jim, the last program we did with you, it was uh, just as Reagan was coming in and uh, we were talking about, oh my gosh, what are some of the horrible things that are going to happen as a result of the uh, Reagan years. And can you kind of give us a rundown and keep us uh, and put, bring us up to date as to what things have happened? Well, yeah, actually, I think uh, all our, our worst fears are realized, <laughs> <laughs> I regret to say. Yeah. Um, it, it, what uh, Reagan did, and uh, followed by Bush, um, was actually a uh, somewhat incredible thing in terms of what happened in um, the history of the American courts. Because uh, during the 12 years that uh, Reagan and Bush were president, they set about uh, very carefully selecting federal judges, um, both uh, in terms of age, they wanted young uh, judges who would last a long time, and in terms of ideology, very carefully choosing judges according to their ideology. In fact, there were uh, litmus test questionnaires that had to be filled out uh, before you could even become uh, named a federal judge. And altogether, over the period of time that they were there, uh, they named 70% uh, of the uh, judges on the uh, appellate courts and the district courts that now sit all the way from the Supreme Court down to the trial courts. So they had an enormous uh, impact and, and that impact will continue uh, because of the young age of the judges. And it was a very uh, carefully uh, embarked upon campaign to select the judges. Usually what had gone on in history prior to that is that, for example, if you had a Republican president, the, pre the president would tend to pick uh, Republicans to be judges, but there was not the ideological litmus test that we saw in this process. In fact, uh, uh, President Reagan at one time bragged uh, that the legacy he would leave the country would be the judges and that they would survive long after he did into the 21st century and they would have their impact. And indeed they have had their impact. Uh, in the 12 years uh, that they, um, that the, both uh, Ronald Reagan and George Bush were president and then the few years that have come since then, uh, the judges uh, typically have been uh, very activist in a, in a uh, conservative direction um, and have uh, very uh, studiously and carefully uh, gone about trying to dismantle uh, a number of the protections that had been uh, developed for individual rights and individual liberty under the Constitution. Virtually every time that the Supreme Court under, uh, th that was form formed by uh, President Reagan to a large extent, virtually every time that court ruled, it ruled in favor of uh, big government and in favor of big business. Uh, I would say that you could easily figure about 95 percent of the time the court came down on the side of big government and big business, uh, depending on the kind of case that was there. Well, they also then, <coughs> as you said, whittled away at the rights and gains which ordinary people and individuals have been able to uh, get. Uh, from previous courts. What are some of those things? Well, for example, a number of um, cases came up in which uh, the Supreme Court would never directly overrule earlier cases, but they would create exceptions. And uh, those exceptions ultimately gutted, there were so many of them that they would gut the original rule. Let me give you two examples. Uh, one deals with the Miranda rule, mm -hmm. and one deals with the force. Um, excessive force that police would use in arrest or uh, people that are in custody. In the first instance, the court never overruled Miranda, 
but would create exceptions. So they would say, for example, well, if the confession that uh, was beat out of the person uh, was harmless, a harmless confession, if the person would have been convicted anyway, well, then that confession uh, was okay. Uh, that the police didn't, uh, even though they violated Miranda, um, it uh, was a harmless error. And the second case, uh, for example, um, it comes up in the context of um, excessive force, that uh, police um, had to, uh, if police use force, for example, in the confession context, again, if it wasn't uh, excessive, if it was, as George Bush would say, a kind and gentle beating, <laughs> then God. it didn't rise to the level of a constitutional uh, violation. And the problem with that kind of direction, of course, is that the reason the Miranda Rule came about in the, because in the experience of the country, and this is particularly true in the Southwest and in the South, uh, police generally would beat uh, people or would um, use some sort of force to get them to sign confessions, and then they would turn around and use those confessions in, uh, to convict somebody. And while that's, also, while that's bad for the individual, of course, it's also bad for society because that means uh, quite often you're not catching actually uh, the criminal who might have perpetrated the crime, yeah. but you're actually convicting the person the police think might have done it. And in an effort to clear their own docket, mm -hmm. uh, get the statistics behind them, uh, they would convict somebody they thought uh, did it or somebody they thought needed to be put away. So the whole purpose of Miranda to kind of professionalize the police force uh, was gutted. Uh, under the uh, Reagan-Bush Supreme Court. And I think uh, that and the way force came into play in that decision is a very good example. Uh, we also saw uh, backing away from a lot of the uh, efforts to desegregate uh, the country, for example, in terms of uh, school districts or uh, breaking down uh, affirmative action programs or uh, government programs to try to hire minority businesses, try to give them a little economic boost uh, to deal with the history of discrimination that they faced. The court backed away and retreated and sometimes overturned all those earlier cases. So as a result, for example, here in Austin, Austin is a great, a perfect example of what happened. We had a, a school um, desegregation plan which was effectively dismantled by the uh, Reagan-appointed a judge who's here, and that was upheld by uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is, not, which is dominated by uh, conservative Reagan-Bush appointees. And as a result now, our school system is back almost segregated as to the extent that it had been prior to the desegregation order. You know, mm. so we, we, didn't, we haven't gotten very far ultimately. They're still doing busing, though. Are they not? <clears throat> not in Austin. Oh, they're not doing that anymore? No, they're not. Uh, the only busing that really occurs is uh, effort, uh, is the busing that goes on uh, to take advantage of the academies. If you're moving from west, uh, if you live on one side of town and you want to go to the academy on the east side of town, mm -hmm. you can um, uh, find busing for that. And the, the really uh, unfortunate thing about this is because the, is that the desegregation plan in Austin was actually working. And I think the most dramatic effect of that, the indicator of that, was when the school board, which was a, elected on this political agenda, uh, was considering about the, whether to dismantle the program. The students all got together and they appeared in front of the school board at a very large hearing. All the students asked that the program continue. Oh, they all okay. asked that it continue because they said they were benefiting from the multicultural and meeting different people and going to different parts of town. They were benefiting from it. It helped them understand what was going on in society and helped their education. But regardless of what the students wanted, of course, uh, the, politi the uh, school board had its own agenda, and, and it was sanctioned by the uh, federal court. And we're now back to where we were um, 20, 30 years ago. As a result of these cases, are we seeing a lot more police abuse? Yes. Uh, the court has made it very uh, difficult uh, to um, sue police. And the court has done that by creating a, the good faith defense. Yeah. yeah, you can beat somebody up if you do it in good faith. That's exactly that, right. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah. That's if you beat them up in good faith, then yeah. you have no liability. And there's a great case where this happened. <laughs> I don't know if it's a great case. It's a sad case in a sense, but it was a Fort Worth situation in which the jury found that the police had used excessive force. But the Court of Appeals, again, the Federal Court of Appeals, said, well, 
the police acted in good faith because they had testified that was the way they were trained. And since they were trained oh, that way, God. that was okay. And they, they did it. It, mean that it may have violated people's rights, but they couldn't recover for the violation of the rights because the police were free from liability because of good faith, because of they acted in good faith. Uh, they didn't have to worry about any kind of liability. So the message that sends, of course, to the police is that you can do what you want and get away with it as long as you claim that you're acting in good faith. And to the citizens, it sends a message that the police are outside of the law. And even when the jury says that they have violated the law, nothing. I mean, you may uh, have suffered a broken arm. Uh, you may be um, paralyzed for life if you were shot by mistake or whatever. And there is no recovery. There is no way that you can um, sue and collect damages as if you could if it happened between two individuals and you were hurt. You know, something, this is a, 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 a broader issue. I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. Over the years, I've seen cases where there was misconduct by the uh, prosecutor, collusion with the judge, suppression of evidence and destruction of evidence by the FBI in collusion with a, with a judge or other agencies. Just gross misconduct on behalf of the prosecution and judges and the FBI law enforcement agencies. And then when the case is over, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens at all to the judge or to the... F to the, the uh, what, is there just no recourse when all this is proven? That's basically it. There really is very little uh, recourse. Uh, you can't bring a civil rights case in a civil, you know, civil case because uh, judges are immune from being sued. Uh, prosecutors are immune from being sued. The only thing you can hope is that you could find a grand jury somewhere that might indict them. But of course, then that depends upon the willingness of another prosecutor right. to bring another prosecutor in front of that grand jury. And you know, the, the uh, blood runs pretty thick in these situations. So you, you don't really find very many cases uh, where this happens, um, virtually none. And as I say, even in a, in a civil rights case, you can't do anything. I mean, case after case after case in which the judges have done um, something wrong or colluded, uh, the courts have said you, they cannot be sued under the civil rights statutes. And uh, this, uh, the Supreme Court has said over and over, even though there is massive uh, bad behavior, illegal behavior on the part of the prosecution and the judge and et cetera, that, and, and the poor guy was convicted, they got, let the conviction stand because he had his day in court. Right. It's an anomaly <laughs> of the system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see the same thing happen in capital punishment cases. I think it's just astounding in which you may have a situation in which the person is convicted at trial, and then a few years later, uh, there will be uh, evidence that come out that very strongly suggests or almost uh, proves conclusively that that person is innocent. But you cannot get a hearing on that because the court has said, the Supreme Court has said, you have, uh, once you've had a trial, and that trial is procedurally correct, then um, that's all you get. The 14th Amendment does not protect you against being wrongly executed, <laughs> but only executed without the proper procedures. A, I find that to be pretty astounding, uh, that uh, under the 14th Amendment, which is supposed to protect your liberty and freedom, means that you could, as long as you have a fair trial, then you can be executed. It doesn't ultimately matter whether or not you are innocent, as long as you've had your trial. And the Supreme Court said, well, we recognize, this is the great irony of this, is Rehnquist, the Chief Justice who writes this opinion, and he's uh, um, made Chief Justice by uh, Ronald Reagan. And he says the, the traditional remedy, he said, we, we know it happens that innocent people are convicted. We know that it happens that innocent people are, set, are, are put on death row, but the traditional remedy that, for that is to ask the governor for clemency. Now, that um, might sound okay, but in reality, uh, it's very hard to imagine any governor who, in, like in Texas, who campaigns on 
the ability to execute people <laughs> is going to turn around in the face of a conviction and let that person go simply because the Supreme Court doesn't want to handle the case and says it, throws it back to the governor and said, well, you can decide whether or not to give this person clemency. We don't really care if that person is guilty or innocent so long as the procedures by which the person was convicted um, were okay. Wasn't there a dissent on that case and one of the justices said this is nothing more than legalized murder? That's right. Which that was Judge Blackman. Blackman said yeah, that. Yeah, and a few months later, uh, Blackman then came, uh, publicly said that he had reversed his position on death penalty in the United States. He had voted for the death penalty quite a bit at the time that it was there, uh, that the cases came up. And he finally reversed himself. He said, you know, I, I have sat there in my home at night when these people come, the di hours before uh, the time to be executed. Their lawyers have sent briefs. And I've agonized over this. And I've listened to the arguments in the court. And I finally have come to the conclusion that even though I philosophically believe in capital punishment, I believe that the state can take the right to the life of somebody, in our system, it cannot operate in a neutral fashion. It, the system currently operates in a discriminatory fashion against people of color and against poor people. There's no way that we are capable as a society to make sure that capital punishment is uh, exercised uh, across the board fairly. And he changed his position. And I read the other day in the, in the New York Times that uh, Justice Powell, who used to be on the Supreme Court at one time and voted for uh, capital punishment, ha has changed his opinion in exactly the same view, uh, that even though philosophically he's not opposed to it, in our society we are unable to administer capital punishment in a way that's fair and uh, does not take into account poverty and does not take into account race or national origin. Well, there are a lot of statistics which back this oh, up, yeah. aren't there? The statistics are overwhelming. Um, that back that up. Um, the statistics show that uh, the race of the victim, for example, uh, plays an enormous, um, uh, is an enormous factor in who ends up on, the death, on death row. That if the victim's white and the uh, uh, assailant is black, for example, that the chances are, are in Texas, for, are four to five greater of being convicted of capital punishment than if the victim is white and the perpetrator is white. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the discretion that comes into play. The prosecutor, for example, gets to decide, the district attorney can decide whether to, char whether to charge the person with murder punishable by capital punishment or murder punishable by life imprisonment. So that's the first step of the discretion that comes into play. The second step of the discretion is in choosing the jury. Mm. It's very, very difficult uh, to choose a jury uh, that can put aside its own feelings and the way it has grown up, the jurors have grown up and the feelings that they have uh, uh, lingering uh, discrimination. And then the jury also exercises the final uh, choice whether that person is to be sentenced to death or not after the person is convicted. All of those different factors. Uh, there's a study here in Texas that just uh, that came out and analyzed data between 1972 and 1988 and um, controlled for 35 different factors and came to that conclusion uh, that, the, that capital punishment in Texas uh, is clearly uh, <clears throat> levied on people according to uh, uh, race, according to national origin, and ultimately, of course, according to poverty. And, and the, the, the unfortunate thing about this is that this very kind of case got in front of the U.S. Supreme Court out of Georgia, in which you had a very um, brilliant uh, statistician uh, named Baldus, uh, who has written books and everything, who did an incredible study in Georgia and proved statistically that it was that race accounted for the disproportionate number of um, African Americans on death row. And the Supreme Court said, well, this study may be interesting as a sociological study, <laughs> you can't Free, be free, or you can't uh, set aside a conviction unless you can show that the people who convicted you intended to discriminate against you because of race. Oh my God! And so it, it's virtually impossible. You can't. Can you imagine putting a district attorney on the stand and say, "Did you discriminate against him on the basis of race?" <laughs> Is he going to say, "Oh yeah, sure, I did," or put the jurors on the stand? What are they going to say? Virtu no one's going to admit it, even if they did, even if. They weren't doing it subconsciously. Even though they did it consciously, they're not going to do it. But 
there the court parts with all the statistical evidence, the degree of probability and all of that, and just simply says, hey, prove it by intent or we're going to send you to the chair. I thought one of the most cynical statements I <clears throat> have ever seen was when I was reading about this case and uh, while it was being pleaded before the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia said, well, you're talking about uh, people being discriminated against or being executed because they're black. If we say uh, that's no good, then somebody can up here, what about ugly people? Should we uh, give exemptions to ugly people? You know, what about uh, crippled people? You know? And it just completely blowing off the real substance and basis of what the people were challenging here. Well, Scalia's a very good example of the kind of appointment I was talking about earlier that comes out of the Reagan-Bush era. Um, very, very um, anti-civil uh, rights, very anti-civil liberties, very pro-government. Virtually only thing that Scalia is good on, uh, from my viewpoint, is on, on free speech issues. And, and on that, ironically, tends to be a classic uh, libertarian. Hmm. But on everything else, um, he's really, really um, hostile. I mean, hostile. And uh, you can see it from his opinions. In fact, probably that's the reason that Scalia is not as effective on the court um, as he could be, because he, he is very, very opinionated, very sarcastic, sardonic in his opinions. Mm -hmm. um, even with justices who might vote like he does, uh, he disparages them quite a bit. Uh, he's very ideological. There's no way, other way to classify him. And he picks up uh, Clarence Thomas with him. And Clarence <laughs> yeah. Thomas and Scalia vote almost alike. And most of the time, of course, it's Thomas simply uh, signing on to Scalia's opinions. Yeah. That's uh, is a big joke about that, I guess, in Washington, the fact that, uh, you know, they've kind of grafted them together. They're almost Siamese twins now. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, as... as uh, Thomas even written an opinion yet for you know many many months he didn't do anything he just sat there and also I understand he didn't say much during uh, the uh, actual hearings and pleadings before the court. Yeah, I don't think uh, Thomas will go down in history as one of the scholars um, on the court. Um, he does uh, basically follow uh, Scalia, uh, Scalia's lead, Scalia's logic. There's some talk uh, of them sharing the same law clerk from time to time. Hmm. Um, he's. Uh, 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 Thomas is a very strange uh, person, as we saw during the nomination process, just in terms of uh, uh, personality and, um, and uh, the way he approaches life. And he seems to, from comments that he's made at speeches and so on, since he's been on the Supreme Court, he's uh, retained uh, that uh, um, facet of his personality. And it's very difficult to, to deal with. It's as if um, um, He's uh, going to prove something, I guess. I mean, <clears throat> I think you're, the, the analogy you, you're, you're drawing is very interesting because in talking to about Scalia and Thomas as being Siamese twins, I think you said, when, you know, Warren um, Berger and Harry Blackman are Nixon, were Nixon appointees, and they went on the court at the same time, and they were both from Minnesota, and they were called the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> and there was a lot of discussion about uh, whether they were going to swing the court to the right. Um, you know, Nixon had campaigned on uh, reforming the court and uh, particularly attacking the opinions that it had made in the area of criminal law. And though, to Nixon's credit, he didn't choose judges as ideologically as uh, Reagan and Bush. And so I think what happened then is that when Warren Berger and Harry Blackman were on the court, uh, even though they had that affinity, uh, having been chosen together, having been judges together, having come from the same state and all of that, they did not, uh, Blackman matured considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, so did Berger, but I wouldn't say as much, but Blackman actually became a, uh, a very good scholar on the court and, and began to think on his own. And I don't think uh, at all we'll see that dynamic occur with Thomas. I think that we'll see uh, Thomas and Scalia together uh, in their corner uh, on the far right for a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the United States has, uh, we're number one, I understand. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the United States incarcerated, uh, I think we were only number three in the world incarceration of its citizens, but although there were some southern states that were uh, surpassed the uh, rest of the world. But now I understand the United States incarcerated more people than uh, any western civilized or industrialized country. Is this a result of the Reagan years? Yes, uh, to a great extent. 
it, it's, a, it's a result of, I think, uh, a very unfortunate um, phenomenon in our society, and that is that the way you get elected right now is by campaigning against criminals. Um, it's a constituency you cannot offend because they don't <laughs> vote. Um, and you campaign uh, against them, and the way we campaign against them is that we'll build more prisons and we'll execute more people. And so we end up with these startling statistics. Uh, we're one of the few countries now uh, in the modern world that executes people. Yeah. And we're one of the few countries, the top country in terms of numbers of people that we incarcerate. Texas, of course, surpassing the prison population of many countries in the world. And the, the problem is that we never see any political leadership. We never see anybody say, well, what, let's just stop a minute, folks. <clears throat> we're spending too much tax money. And the result we're getting is not worth it. All we're doing is building more prisons. It is not economically productive in our society. It costs us twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year per prisoner. And by what we do by doubling our prison system, as that is our goal right now in Texas, and we're almost halfway there, is that we take all of this dead end money and we take it away from schools. We take it away from social services. Uh, we take it away from community services. And what we do is then create the probability that there will then be more people that we will have to incarcerate. Instead of figuring out well, how can we make this, if this was in the private sector, every politician would be fired by now. <laughs> you can't run a prison system the way it's being run. It is not economically feasible. The, the management would have been, had their heads lopped off. The board of directors would have hired somebody new by now. Not only that, but the results, <clears throat> the statistics don't show that just putting people in jail or executing them results in less crime. No, they, they don't. They don't at all. Um, the states that do not have capital punishment uh, have the same kind of um, crime rate as the states that do have capital punishment. It has no effect whatsoever. And that's because most murder happens uh, because of passion. It's not premeditated. And so you don't really have, it is, the capital punishment is not a deterrent. Everybody now admits that. Nobody now argues, no matter what side of this issue you're on, nobody now argues that it's a deterrent. The only question now is whether society is entitled to do this as vengeance. That's the only <laughs> issue. Yeah. And can, is society entitled to do this as vengeance? That's all that, it, but you figure, if you, it takes you, <clears throat> for a county to execute somebody now, it costs about a million dollars, all the way from the trial process, all the way through the appeal to the Supreme Court and all of that, because you have to appoint counsel, and you, the way that it, it takes, a, it's about a three or four week trial, the appeals, um, there are about four or five appeals that go on, and it costs about a million dollars. You see some counties now, for example, Dallas, that last year only sent one person to capital, uh, sent one person to death row, because it's too expensive. Hmm. You can do the same thing, you take that money, and reinvested in the criminal justice system, you can have a better result and just put that person away for life. Take that person on society for life and then take the money that you would have spent to execute the person and reinvest it in the capital punishment, so the capital, in the, I'm sorry, the criminal justice system. Houston, uh, which is probably the most bloodthirsty county right now in Texas in terms of capital punishment. Uh, in fact, more people are in death row from, Tex from Harris County than from mo most of the countries in the world that still do have capital punishment, and from most of the states. There are more people on death row from Harris County than from most of the states in the Union right now. That's how many people are coming out of Harris County. But because of that, their courts in Harris County are going to be tied up until the year 2020, right now, doing nothing but capital punishment trials. And how does that help our criminal justice system? It doesn't. You take the twenty to $25,000 it costs you per year to house somebody. And imagine what you can do in terms of, of uh, rehabilitating that person or investing it to deal with that person. Because, because most crimes for which people are in, are in prison right now are not violent crimes. They come out of basically poverty, how to make it on the streets and take that money. And for less than the $25,000 that it costs to incarcerate them, you could do something so that they wouldn't be in a dead end and we wouldn't have to support them. 
it would be a more productive society. There is one uh, benefit <coughs> as far as those people that, that uh, happens when they are in prison, and that is they learn a lot more on how to commit crimes. Yeah. I was talking to a fellow who had spent a little bit of time in jail before his case was dismissed. He said they spend so much time talking about how not to get caught, uh, new scams, and when they watch television, they watch the police uh, uh, programs on television, they look to see what, what works and what doesn't, and even that falls in, comes into this equation on how to be better criminals. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's right. I mean, none of the programs right now that you have in prison work. Yeah. They, don't, they don't work because they spend most of the time, the prisoners spend most of the time with other prisoners learning how to be better criminals when they get out. It's because of the culture that's there in the prison. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get somebody in the prison system, you can count on their recidivism, that person going back into prison later on, being somewhere like 40 to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 we, we don't look at this as a, a, an economic issue um, in terms of what it's doing to our society, we let the politicians drumbeat this issue. And it just sort of becomes cyclical. They drumbeat it, we parrot it, they parrot us, we parrot them again, and it goes on and on and on without ever stopping to think, wow, why are we taking all this money away from the education system to build prisons? I mean, people now in Texas are competing to have a prison put in their county because they want the economic benefit from it. It's crazy. It's crazy. They ought to take the same money and build a college or build a school or invest in an economic development instead of putting it into dead end things like, like uh, prisons. And the other bad thing about this, <clears throat> Frank, is that 10 to 20 percent of the people right now in prison are there because they're mentally disabled. They either have mental illness or mental uh, retardation. And, and what happened, and, and they're there because of what's happening, is that we shut down the institutions now. Instead of providing for uh, community housing and community programs to help deal with people that have mental disability, they're on the streets. And so they engage in a lot of uh, what we would call antisocial behavior, and they end up in prison. And then when they get out of prison, there is no way, <clears throat> no program for them to hook into. So they get back out in the same activity. They don't know a lot of the, if you have someone that has mental retardation, has an IQ, for example, of 70, does not understand the concept of dealing with a, pro, a parole officer. So they're out on the streets and they get their parole revoked because they're not dealing with a parole officer and they're back in prison again. Hmm. They have a recidivism rate of 80%. Not only that, but a lot of the people that come out, um, I, I represent some people in, ca in a case right now we're doing uh, in this issue. We have two women who, when they were released from prison, were simply put on a bus. One went to Houston, and one was supposed to be going to El Paso, and she ended up in Los Angeles. Both women were raped on the street and repeatedly abused, and eventually had the parole revoked because they hadn't reported the parole officer, and were back in the, parole system, back in the prison system. It doesn't make any sense. But that's the way we're dealing with these issues right now um, as a society because of the way they're politicized. We don't have any leaders with guts that simply say, let's reevaluate this program, let's deal with it in a different way. You've been working on perhaps in <coughs> cases concerning civil rights in high school, do you not? Yeah, actually. Yeah, uh, the, I, I thought the courts have said that those kids have no rights. <coughs> I mean, what I've seen, no rights at all. Well, they have very few. Uh, we may f if we lose these cases, they won't have anything whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> these are cases that are brought under um, a federal law called Title IX, uh, which is part of the education amendments, and it, that law pro prohibits uh, sex discrimination in schools. And we have two cases. That oh, oh, sex. Sex. Okay. Yeah. And what we we have two cases uh, involving Bryan Independent School District, in which uh, two, uh, three girls actually. Uh, were very uh, severely sexually harassed, uh, touched and uh, groped, uh, insulted, all sorts of bad language over a period of time by in the school bus by other students, students. boys, uh, on the buses, in the classroom, in the hallways. Administration knew about it, there was a whole history of complaints, and the district did nothing. And uh, ironically, uh, we got these complaints at the same time um, that the American Association of University uh, uh, Women released their report. 
talking about the, the pervasiveness of uh, sexual harassment in the schools. That 80 percent of the students in some fashion or another have suffered uh, sexual harassment. And something like, if I recall this correctly, 25 or 30 percent, maybe as high as 40, have actually had physical uh, harassment occur. So it is an ext extremely uh, pervasive problem. It's something that we never talked about for a long time, right? It was much like child abuse. Uh, we never talked about it for a long time in our society. But it is a, a very severe problem. And the question now is whether the school administrators, if they know this is going on and if they fail to discipline the students, whether this isn't a uh, violation of federal law. Mm. And uh, we'll be litigating those in, in federal court. And I think they'll have a big uh, impact upon what goes on in the schools because if the administrators begin to understand that they are responsible for uh, making sure this doesn't happen, or when it does happen, for punishing it, uh, then they're going to have a whole different attitude toward this. You know, the attitude they have right now, and they said this, well, you know, these are teenage boys. Yeah. You know, so what? I mean, part of the idea of going to school is to learn how to function in society. And we don't tolerate this, we're not supposed to tolerate this in our economic sector or any other sector after you're 18. <laughs> If you don't teach kids this while they're in school, uh, what is the message you're teaching them uh, that they're supposed to be doing, that they should be doing or uh, not be doing when they get out? But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens, uh, how favorable the judges will be. I don't know if there's any validity of this. It seems to me that much of this has recurred after the Reagan administration came in. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, it was considered really bad form when people had find with women's liberation and uh, the men were more were responding to this and uh, and the genders were more equal becoming more equal uh, but then <clears throat> all these barriers seemed to fall apart during the Reagan administration and I began to hear racist remarks around schools and on CB <laughs> radios uh, overtly racist and sexist and uh, so I wonder if this harassment has started back or started up uh, just in the past uh, say since 1980s or whether something has been going on all the time and uh, <clears throat> we just didn't address it as a problem well I think it maybe put your 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 finger on it by um, talking about um, the president because I think to a large extent the administration sets the um, cultural tone for the country. And if uh, the cultural tone for the country is we need to do away with discrimination, uh, we have to end racism, we have to do away with sexual harassment, then that kind of behavior you're talking about um, is unacceptable, or at least um, more unacceptable than usual. But if the tone of the country becomes, or the tone set by the administration becomes, um, well, folks, this isn't quite as bad. Uh, we don't look upon this the same disdain uh, that was looked upon it in an earlier administration. Then I think what you see is you see a rise in that kind of uh, behavior occur. See, I think, you know, the, the Reagan-Bush uh, drum beating that went on about affirmative action was that. It was, you know, and they started talking about affirmative action being racial preference and all that kind of stuff. Anybody who looks at an affirmative action program knows it's not about quota, quotas, it's not about preferences. None of that stuff is in an affirmative action program the way, the way they're designed um, and used. But there's a myth that's created that that's exactly what they are. You know, and you hear Reagan telling these anecdotes or, you know, he was, he governed by anecdote almost, you know, and it was a great disservice to the country in a sense. And, and you set this, uh, so what it becomes, you start attacking affirmative action programs, it becomes a way, it's a message that's sent to society. Race is doing away with racial discrimination no longer is a priority in this country. And I think that's the real um, problem. I mean, what he does with the courts, of course, I think is bad. Da is, has been damaging. But the whole mood that we lived under for 12 years yeah, it sets up this culture that allows and countenances this sort of activity to occur. It really, in a sense, sets us back. 
Because if you look at it, kind of a historical continuum that we go through, you know, from the uh, 40s into the 50s and the 60s about changing the way uh, we treated women or the way that we treated minorities, you'll see that these 12 years are really a, a setback um, over the whole course of history. I'm sure that in 50 years from now we'll look back and we'll see that during this period there was a lull, sort of like in the early part of the Reagan years. It was a lull, I'm sorry, of the Eisenhower years. There was kind of a lull in this. And for the 12 years that Reagan and Bush were there, I, th I think we'll probably see it'll, it'll be even cast worse than a lull. It'll, it'll be a step or two backwards from which we have to uh, recover, um, you know, in our pr progress as a society. And I guess, uh, how can this be done? Groups, <clears throat> individuals like you and groups like the Texas Civil Rights Project are in the forefront of this. What just about ordinary American people? We know American people can do a lot. I mean, individuals. We do a lot as individuals. I mean, if you look at what we do uh, as volunteers uh, with Boy Scouts and with uh, PTA and as school groups and, and helping uh, in soup kitchens and all that. Individuals in our, in our country really do a lot, uh, incredible amount of work for people. And people, what, what, part of the thing that we can do is that in our work that way, um, we can use that process as a way of educating. And when we hear racism or we hear sexism or we see something happen, we need to talk up. Sometimes we defer a lot, right? So, well, you know, people are entitled to their views and stuff. And people are entitled to their views, but you're also entitled to say, hey, you know, we really, we, do we really want to be talking like that? And we ought to go sometimes when issues touch us or we particularly discuss it with something, go down to the city council and, and complain about it. Go to the school board and complain. You don't have to go there all the time. But if everybody did it once in a while, we'd be a lot further off. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are very disgusted about some of the censorship going on uh, over religious agenda in uh, public schools. But to go down to the city council, I mean down to the school board and complain about it, it's a very important thing. Write letters to the editor, very important thing. A lot of people can do that. It doesn't take a lot of effort, but people can do that. And people, to a large extent, also need to think things through. Um, there's a lot of talk show stuff going on right now, because as we sit here talking, <laughs> a lot of talk show stuff going on, in, in, in which people, <clears throat> I think, don't some, sometimes don't um, uh, stop and think about the code words that are used and stop, think, and stop and think about what really is going on in this talk show and sort of accept some of the stuff they hear, um, uh, this uh, drumbeat of cynicism that uh, President Clinton referred to. Um, I, I think it's one thing to criticize, um, and I think that uh, we need to do that. We've got to do that, and we have to, but we have to do it, we have to do it in a way that's uh, constructive. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that's going on right now is that we don't hear a debate about health care. Right. We don't hear a debate. We hear a debate about what Clinton did as a governor some years ago, or may have done, or may not have done. And, you know, when you really think about it, what, this is deflecting us from a, something that's of great importance to an enormous number of people uh, that we see on the streets, uh, that we know, a lot of people that we know can't get health care anymore. It used to get health care, can't get anymore. And health care for a lot of people is a very oppressive issue, um, particularly if you're older or if you have kids that are, can be chronically sick. It's a very, very oppressive issue. And we don't hear the debate going on about that, you know, that we ought to have. You know, how are we going to make our system better than what it is? But I think individuals have got to do that. We've really got to accept that responsibility and do it. New opinions are always suspected and usually opposed without any other reason but because they are not already common. John Locke, 1690. In another maquiladora in the Matamoros area, former tech workers are producing fiberglass swimming pool slides, bumpers, and air shields. Now they work with high concentrations of plastics, solvents, paints, and rubbers. Some of these workers feel sick as early as 10 a.m. Extractors and gloves are not provided for these workers. The rubber overalls, which are provided, are virtually unusable because there is no air conditioning in the plant they are working in, and it makes it extremely hot and uncomfortable for them to wear them while they are working. Women are having it tough in Eastern European countries, particularly in the former Soviet Union and in Poland. The uh, Nation on April 4th had an article about this. They said that uh, women are losing their jobs in vast numbers vastly uh, disproportionate to men. 
daycare centers are closing, abortion in country after country is now being restricted. And, uh, well, what about Poland? Poland has almost become a Catholic theocracy. According to a National Public Radio report, the church seems to be hell-bent on living up to the worst fears of Protestant anti-popery ranters. Uh, abortions are illegal. Three-year jail terms are given to doctors who perform them. Birth control is hard to find and very much overpriced. Religion is uh, permeating the public schools even there, where sex education is taught by priests. And they have a textbook there where they don't let them say penis. They've got to say <clears throat> the male source of life that is external to the body. And at even the village level, there seems to be a lot of uh, church tyranny going on. Uh, there was an incident where a priest who insisted the two little girls whose parents had not gone to a church wedding, the poor little girls were forced to wear cloth badges in the shape of black hearts. Now we can't forget that in Poland, pre-World War II and World War II Poland, the Catholic Church assisted the Nazis in eradication of the Jews. And little girls may be forced to wear forced to wear cloth badges in the shape of black hearts. It kind of reminds you of the Jews who were forced to wear Star of David cloths on their clothing. And that's Alternative Views for this time. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank the people who helped make the program possible, our crew members. Brian Lynch was our director. And our camera people were Priscilla Rice and Rob Freeman. There are some other people who helped with other segments of the program. Eric Eubank and Kevin L. West were our crew people for some of the news segments. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So that's our address if you'd like to write to us. We'd love to hear from you. Goodbye.